Hi. Hello. My name is Stephanie and welcome or if you're back, welcome back. Either way, I'm glad you're here and I hope you're well. And yes, <laughs> we're talking about Dune again. Sorry, I like Dune, so I like talking about it a lot. So here we are. <laughs> and speaking of which, so that Dune 2 popcorn bucket, you've seen it. I've seen it. It was on SNL. We've all seen it. And if you haven't, I'm delighted to be the one to show it to you. And here it is in all its unhinged glory. And to say it's an interesting design is an understatement. <laughs> and when I tell you, as soon as I saw it, as soon as I saw this thing, because I, I think about 10 people <laughs> that I know in real life and online uh, sent it to me, I knew I had to have it. Look at it. Look at the bucket. How could I not? Look at it. It's hilarious. But therein lay the problem, at least on my end. The Worm Bucket is an AMC exclusive and I don't live near one. I actually had no idea how very much I didn't <laughs> live near one until I actively started looking for one. And at the time that I started doing that, with the intention of getting my hands on this delightful piece of merchandise, uh, February 2024, for those of you in the future, wasn't, and as far as I know, at the time of filming, uh, March 2024, again, for those of you in the future, isn't for sale on their website. So I did what anyone would do. Maybe not, but if there's one thing I am, it's committed to a bit. I drove a not insignificant distance to the nearest AMC, the one at CityWalk, the shopping district that's right outside Universal Studios Hollywood in search of the aforementioned worm. <laughs> This is partially a joke, as I was going to Universal Studios anyway for a little day trip because I had a three-day weekend, so the plan was to make a brief pit stop to AMC to get the worm. A two birds, one stone kind of thing. But honestly, if that hadn't been the plan, I, I, I would have done this anyway, <laughs> to be completely honest. And not to keep you in suspense, I got the worm. And it's a very fine addition to my Dune collection. And don't worry, I'm going to show it to you in all its deranged glory. But we're also going to be talking about slightly unhinged Dune 1984 merchandise. Because Dune having weird merchandise is not a new thing, but rather a proud tradition in the history of Dune-related cinema. So let the journey begin. So merchandising, even as we know it today, is very much not a new thing. Jasper Fremont Meek, who is often referred to as the founding father of merchandise, created the very first branded tote bag for a shoe store all the way back in 1878. But even before then, there were almanacs and advertising calendars. We, we've never been free <laughs> uh, from advertising. However, until the 1970s, there really wasn't a hell of a lot of movie merchandising being done. The exception being Disney, who was offered $300 to put Mickey Mouse on writing tablets back in 1929, the year after Steamboat Willie became a huge hit. And the money from those writing tablets helped to finance the studio so they would are able to make more animation and other things, right? Thus began the merchandising empire that is the Disney company. But like I said, they were the exception rather than the rule at this point. So what happened? What made the other studios finally jump on the merchandising bandwagon? To put it super simply, it was Star Wars. Star Wars happened. To give a very, 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 I cannot emphasize that enough, very, a bridge history of the whole thing, when George Lucas was trying to get Star Wars made after their surprise hit that was American Graffiti, he got turned down by several studios. <laughs> Can you imagine? Hindsight is a hell of a thing. And imagine the being the people who passed on Star Wars. I, that would keep me up at night. I cannot even imagine. But eventually, 20th Century Fox was willing to take a chance on this weird sci-fi movie that George Lucas was pitching, despite sci-fi not being a very profitable genre at the time, and offered to finance what would become A New Hope. And the initial deal included a $500,000 directing fee, which George Lucas, to the surprise of everyone, turned down in exchange for retaining the rights to merchandising and to any sequels. And Fox agreed to this, and later when <laughs> George Lucas sold Star Wars to Disney, it's why he was able to sell it for literally billions of dollars. And that is billions with a B. Again, hindsight, it's a hell of a thing. George Lucas was able to get Star Wars made, and Star Wars wasn't just a hit. It was 
the hit. I am very, very much not saying that movie merchandise didn't exist before Star Wars. Hell, there were Jaws beach towels. Or that it invented movie merchandising. That is very, very much not the case. But Star Wars absolutely helped launch the concept of using toys to market movies. The concept of movie-based toys was such a novel idea that every major toy company that George Lucas approached to make toys for Star Wars that were going to be modeled after their initial concept concept art, just kind of flat out rejected the proposal. Again, hindsight, hell of a thing, right? Enter Kenner, a small company that was at the time owned by General Mills. Uh, Yes, that General Mills, who agreed to produce toys based on Star Wars in 1976. Except, like I said, Star Wars wasn't just a hit. It was the hit. It was, at the time, the highest grossing film of all time. And Kenner was simply not prepared for the sheer demand for these toys. Again, they were a much smaller toy company. And they almost instantly ran out of merchandise. To give you an idea of how fast these things were selling, A New Hope came out in May 1977, right? We know this. And Kenner wasn't caught up with manufacturing by Christmas of that year, right? So several months later. So they came up with what was a brilliant idea to sell what they called the early bird certificate package, which was a literal empty box that came with a certificate that kids would fill out that guaranteed that when the figures were finally produced, that they would be the first to get them. Think about how wild that is for a second. Star Wars was so popular that Kenner was able to sell kids an empty box and a promise that they'd get toys eventually, right? an empty box. And it took over a year before the toys were finally available, and yet the demand was still just as high. And in the meantime, although the actual action figures weren't available yet, if Star Wars could be put on something, puzzles, clothes, bedding, games, lunchboxes, it was. And people couldn't keep it on the shelf. The Toys That Made Us on Netflix has an episode about Star Wars toys and the way that they change not only the toy industry, but kind of the way movies are merchandise that tells a much more thorough version of the story than the abridged version that yours truly gave you that I highly recommend. Not just that episode, but the series as a whole, because it's a really good series. The Hello Kitty episode made me cry. Do with that what you will. What does all this have to do with Dune? Well, to put it super simply, Universal thought that David Lynch's Dune was going to be their Star Wars. Hindsight, like I said, hell of a thing. Virginia Madsen, who played Princess Erlon in the 1984 movie, even said in an interview that they thought they were essentially making Star Wars for grown-ups. Hindsight, hell of a thing. <laughs> like I keep saying, because we know how that went. But we'll get there. So they tried to merchandise Dune like it was Star Wars, which leads to some really fun, slightly unhinged pieces of merchandise. And not to shamelessly self-promote, but this video is kind of a sister to the Dune Adaptations video that I did a couple weeks back, and if you want a more detailed explanation about the production of Dune 1984 and how we got there, then that's the video for you. But again, to give you a very abridged version of events, after Hodorowski's Dune was cancelled, producer Dino De Laurentiis bought the film Film rights to Dune in 1976. But despite getting Frank Herbert himself to write the script and getting Ridley Scott to direct, the initial attempt fell through and nothing was done with the rights until 1981, when they had to use them or they were going to lose them. Again, these are never the ideal conditions to make a movie. This is how you get things like Dragon Ball Evolution, much less to try and translate something as dense and lore-heavy as Dune into something appealing and understandable to a general audience that might not be familiar with the source material anyway. And honestly, the Dune-Star Wars comparison gets made a lot. I've seen a ton of it... (laughs) lately online with how successful Dune Part 2 is, and understandably so, because like I've said before, the Star Wars-Dune connection runs very deep, and without Dune, Star Wars as we know it would probably look very, very different. And when the 2021 movie was coming out, Dune Part 1, you saw this a lot, that Denis Villeneuve's Dune was going to be the next Star Wars. But the thing is, for all their connection and comparisons, The Dune Saga and the Star Wars Saga are very different entities, especially 
tonally. And to editorialize a bit on my end, I genuinely don't think Universal Studios realized this, that how different they were, until it was too late. Because the way that they tried to merchandise Dune is so wildly different from the actual tone of the movie they got. Because David Lynch's Dune is very, very dark. It is very, very macabre. It is very, very David Lynch which I think is partially why I love it so much, but it is definitely very different in tone from Star Wars. But they tried to merchandise it like Star Wars, which leads to some very tonally confusing, but funny, <laughs> pieces of merchandise. And to start us off, I'm going to show you a couple pieces of official Dune merchandise from my own collection. So take it away live but still very much pre-recorded me. So this is the Dune Storybook by Joan D. Vinge. I'm not sure <laughs> how well you can see that. You do not want to know the precarious uh, situation my camera's in. But this is the Dune Storybook by Joan D. Vinge, adapted from a screenplay by David Lynch based on the novel by Frank Herbert. And it is exactly what it looks like. It is an adaptation of David Lynch's Dune for young readers. And honestly, as far as novelizations go, it's actually not bad. <laughs> Uh, to be quite honest, it's a really good condensed retelling of the movie, and what's cool about it is it actually includes uh, some photos and descriptions of deleted scenes. Like right here, we've got the Shut Up Mapes giving Lady Jessica the Chris knife. We've also got the Baby Sandworm, which is where they get the water of life. And just, <laughs> hang on. Look, look at some of these. Here, look at this page here. This book has some absolutely gorgeous full color photos. This, this page right here is, is kind of terrifying. And I would make a joke about, you know, oh my God, what kind of kid would want this? But it, it's me. It's me. I'm the target audience. I read Dune for the first time when I was 12. I would have loved this. I'm the target audience. The call is very much coming from inside the house. Let me show you my favorite uh, full color photo. As you can see, it was a former library book and I got it on Thrift Books a couple years ago when it popped up for sale. This is uh, my favorite of the full color photos. Putnam actually produced quite a few of these young reader uh, movie retellings. When I was a kid, we had the E.T. and Return of the Jedi books. And while I can't find a complete list of every retelling uh, that they did a young reader version of online, my mom remembers there being a Last Starfighter book too, and I looked it up and yeah. <laughs> I like uh, this bit <laughs> here in the very back of the book where you can find other young reader friendly uh, book recommendations such as God Emperor of Dune and Heretics of Dune. <laughs> Again, I'd make a joke, but I read Dune for the first time when I was 12 and as you can tell, I've been super normal about it ever since. So again, call very much coming from inside the house in my case. Next we have one of my favorite Dune things that I own, and this is the Dune activity book based on the spectacular movie. And I have to show you <laughs> the back of this because I think it perfectly shows the disconnect between the actual tone of David Lynch's Dune and then the way it was merchandised. Because again, that disconnect is very, very real. So relive all the excitement and adventure from the movie Dune. Pencils and crayons are all that you need to begin your fantastic, fun-filled journey to the amazing planet called Dune. Because I know when I think of Dune, the first thing that I think of is in fact a fun-filled journey. I, I do in fact love that. <laughs> and this isn't the only Dune activity book. No, no. As you can see, there are many fun Dune activity books to do Dune-related activities in, such as the Dune activity book, the Dune Coloring and Activity Book, the Dune Coloring Book, the Dune Cutout Activity Book, the Dune Puzzles, Games, Mazes, and Activities Book, and the Dune Pop-Up Panorama Book, which I actually just got the Pop-Up Panorama Book on eBay. It sadly won't get here in time to show you in this video, but if you want to see it when it gets here, uh, literally just let me know. I, I like showing off my Dune stuff. So what kind of fun Dune related activities can we do in our activity book? Well, I am just so glad that you asked. 
We can do this dot to dot of a guild navigator. We can solve the Reverend Mother's mind trick. We can make Paul's no-bake spice cookies, which like all jokes aside, this is actually a really, really good recipe. I've made these many, many times and they're kind of a hit at potlucks. Uh, do with that what you will. We can also uh, color this picture of the Baron, <laughs> you know, as all kids uh, want to do. And we can also uh, make the journey from Castle Caladan uh, to the Palace on Arakeen. I have forced my friends uh, to play this many, many times <laughs> uh, during our game nights, and I low-key love it. And survey says that it's a pretty good time. There was also a board game based on the movie that I do not have, but I would very much like to have and to play, but I digress. There is also, oh, look at this. We can, you know, make Shy Halud you know, do a dot to dot of Old Father Eternity. And one of my personal favorites <laughs> in this book, we can color Lady Jessica undergoing the spice agony because I know that's what I think of <laughs> when I think of the spice agony. Part of the reason I love this so much is not only because it's delightful, <laughs> which it very much is in my opinion, but again, this is just so tonally different from David Lynch's Dune, that if you had never seen that movie and I handed you this book and then showed you the movie afterwards, I think the confusion would in fact be very, very real. So before I send you back to pre-recorded me, I'm going to show you my book and my movie buttons. To be clear, these aren't especially weird and are pretty standard pieces of movie merchandise, but they're still kind of cool in my opinion, so I'm going to show them off. So I've got a set of four movie buttons. We've got the two moons uh, over Arrakis. We've got the sandworm and the sandworm riders. Oh, they're kind of hard to see, but uh, they are on there. <laughs> we've got Paul and Fade Ralza, just a couple of besties, you know, hanging out. And we've got Dune, a world beyond your dreams, uh, the tagline uh, for the movie. These are all fantastic, but these two are by far uh, some of my favorites. I just think uh, these are really cool. And this is my copy of Dune, one of 15, 16, sorry, one of 16, that I have that has the movie poster cover, which I actually think is really cool and it matches uh, this button. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of fun. And even though we've got uh, these small pictures here on the back, there is sadly uh, no movie photos in the book, uh, which is kind of a shame because, you know, I like that kind of thing. <laughs> do you think though, if I filled this out and sent it to Berkeley Publishing, do you think they would send me like some vintage copies of Dune for $3.95? <laughs> what do you think the odds are that I would get a response if I actually uh, sent this in? Again, these are not super weird as far as Dune merchandise goes, but they're still kind of cool in my opinion. And like I said, I like showing off my Dune stuff. So once again, I send you back to pre-recorded me. Thanks for that live, but still pre-recorded me. So in addition to a young reader movie novelization and assortment of coloring and activity books, the coloring and activity book itself actually features a page with a dead Duke Leto. <laughs> that you can color. I'm going to try and find it and I'll, I'll, I'll put it next to me, which is just so, so hilariously macabre. I, I, I cannot. It is hilarious. And a pop-up panorama book that you can use to recreate your favorite scenes from the movie with little punch-out paper dolls. There was also a line of Dune action figures that were made, including Paul, the Baron, Raban, Fade, a Sadukar warrior, Stilgar, and Sandworm, which I want the Sandworm so bad. <laughs> You have no idea, as well as a sand crawler that was motorized and a spice scout vehicle. These were made by LJN and they did not sell well upon their release. <laughs> Probably because the movie itself performed so poorly, but because of that, it means they are actually a pretty rare collectible now, especially the Sadukar Warrior. So if you find one, hold on to it and use it to retire because they sell for some wild amounts sometimes. 
There was also plans for a Lady Jessica figure and a Gurney Halleck figure, as well as a Thopter, which would have been just so, so cool, but they were sadly never produced because the toys sold so poorly, so we never got those. In 2022, a couple years ago, Super 7 actually released a line of action figures based on those original LJN figures, and they're really cool. I wish they'd do a re-release of the worm, though. <laughs> I actually have the little figure of Paul on my desk at work, so and he's pretty cool. If action figures and activity books and novelizations and movie buttons aren't your thing, maybe you'd like a Dune Viewmaster to watch 21 of your favorite moments from the movie in stunning 3D on which you can put in your Dune lunchbox featuring a death match between Paul and Fade, which like if we don't get that for this movie, I, I'm going to be so disappointed. And we can make a list of all these pieces of weird Dune merchandise in our Dune notebook. And we can use our Dune pencil case to hold our pens and pencils, folks. We've got this in the bag. And just as an aside, if you were a school-age person when David Lynch's Dune came out and owned any of these school supplies, the stationery, the lunchbox, any of it, please tell me. Please tell me in the comments and know that you are literally... <laughs> <laughs> the coolest person in my opinion. And now this isn't to say that all the merchandise for Dune 1984 was weird. You also had your standard pieces of movie merchandise like the four movie buttons that I showed you and the book with the movie cover. There was also a guide to the movie and even trading cards which given how many of these are for sale online unopened packs and even full boxes of them at that I'm assuming that like the action figures, these did not sell very well, but unlike the action figures, there must have been a lot of them out there on the market just based on how many of them are out there now in the state that they're in and what they sell for. Not an expert or much of a card collector myself, but that's just the assumption I'm making from my many, many years of Dune collecting. But again, that's just an assumption. Do with that what you will. Do you want to know what my favorite piece of Weird Dune merchandise is? Do you want to know what I scour dead stock stores and antique stores for and search on eBay for constantly? What if I had several hundred dollars that I would have bought without a moment's hesitation when it popped up on eBay back in 2020? I am so glad that you asked. And it is my great honor to show you the Dune party supplies. I love these so damn much. It is probably unhealthy. And I hope that there was a kid out there that actually had a Dune themed birthday party. Because when I tell you that's the dream, I am not exaggerating. I am not exaggerating. So that's my favorite piece of weird merchandise from the 1984 movie that I would love to own. Now I'm going to show you my favorite piece of weird merchandise that I got for Dune Part 2. So let's finally finally look at the worm bucket. So here it is, the moment you have been waiting for. Here is the worm bucket. Sorry, I am trying to film this one-handed and not show you just all the crap on my kitchen table, but here it is. Uh, weirdness aside, although there is a significant amount of weirdness, it's really just your standard uh, popcorn bucket and the worm bit, as you can see is uh, completely removable. It was 25 bucks and change. Honestly, considering what some popcorn buckets go for, when I bought this, they were selling uh, some of the little cat ones, the Florkins from the Marvels movie, and those were like 50 bucks. So I mean, all things considered, like it's not bad price-wise. In my eagerness to get my hands on this delightfully weird thing, I neglected to think about the logistics of it all. This is the little backpack that I typically take with me uh, when I go to different theme parks. It's fairly small and you can take it pretty much anywhere, but therein lies the problem. As you can see, the worm was not fitting in that bag. No, there is no way in hell the worm <laughs> was fitting in that bag. Like I said, I did not think about the logistics of this whole thing. So what's a girl to do? Did I get a locker? Did I take it to my car? No. <laughs> No, I got out one of the reusable bags uh, that I carry with me, put the worm in it, and took it with me 
to Universal Studios. I didn't think to film any of that, unfortunately. I'm not very good at the whole vlogging thing. Uh, but here's some pictures of the worms enjoying the scenery around the Jurassic World ride, which I rode for the first time. It was really, really fun. And here's me showing the worm uh, the bride. She's a legend, she's an icon, and she will always be famous. And then when I got home, I fed it some fries. I think it had a good time. I know I did. It still needs a name, though. So, like, if you have name suggestions, I I'm open to them. So, is the Dune 2 popcorn bucket weird? It is absolutely weird. It is absolutely, wonderfully, hilariously weird, in my opinion. But Dune movie merchandise has had a long and prestigious history of being weird. <laughs> <laughs> wonderfully weird, I would say. So this vaguely NSFW and endlessly amusing popcorn bucket can join the ranks of the weirdly macabre coloring books, pop-up books, and what is perhaps the best set of party supplies ever created with its freaky worm head held high. So until next time, as always, thank you so much for listening to all this. And until next time, stay healthy, stay safe, and I will see you in the next one. Bye-bye.